So this is kind of a unit five study guide, but in our own special order. This is really going to focus more on what is directly apparent on the test. So that uh, because we're down to such a limited amount of time, you know what's going to be on it and what the answers should look like. So to start with, uh, I'm going to I skipped from the study guide down to question number 17, and this is A, B, C, and D. So it says convert the exponential functions into logarithms. So how do we do that? Anybody remember from previous? Um, you, you did the thing where you underlined your base underlined and then you, base. you moved it. Yeah. So in a log, where would I put this base at? I am looking at my notes. Perfect. So then that becomes your constant? Uh, it's not so much a constant, it's just naming what the log is, log four. Okay. So the logarithm of a base four, um, because an exponential function and a logarithm are just inverses where it's shown on a graph, they were like mirror images of each other, where the in a logarithm, the focus becomes solving for the exponent. In an exponential function, the focus is solving for what does it equal? Like, what does that exponential value equal? So we're just rewriting it. So yeah, so we underline the base and then where do we go from there? We start to circle around, right? So the base is always connected to another value and we write the base as a subscript. It's not always really easy to do when you're typing it in. So that's, that's okay. Um, but we have a four and one, zero, two, four. So this is called um, the argument. I don't know why they call it that, but it's the argument. So this is the, the, the value that you reach. So what it's asking is if I have a base four, I get 1,024 when my exponent is five. So that's all it's saying is saying, okay, now it's focused on, okay, what exponential value gets me this value, this total amount when my base is four? That's, so all it is, is we're looping around, looping around, starting at our base, connecting it to the second number as we go counterclockwise, and then having it equal the exponent, okay? So how would we write this one in a logarithm form? We call this log what? P. Log P of K. K is T. T. Excellent. You bet. That's weird. It could, it's it's just all all inverses are doing because here my input is here, my output is there. In a logarithm. That output is now my input, and it equals my output, which was the input over here, because that's all in inverses are. It's the switching of x and y values. So what was my input here is my output here. What was my output here is my input here. That's all that is doing, the switching where what the x and y values are at. Okay, so how would we say, how would we write this one? Okay, is it um, log 64 of four when the exponent is one third? Yep, log 64 of four is one third. So, 64 to the one third power is four. Yeah. Awesome. 
Last one. Log B of one equals zero. Wunderbar, there you go. You have gotten all your points on that one. So now we have a set of logarithms that we need to convert to exponential form. And it's really important we know, need to know how to do this because if we are ever trying to solve for our variable or not our variable, our exponent, we have to, we can't do it in this format. We have to have it in exponential functions so we can use the property of like bases to solve. So what would this log look like as an exponential function? What's our base? Would it be two to the eighth equals 256? Yes, excellent. We start at our base. We circle around and we attach whatever is on the equal sign to that value. And then when we cross back over, it's going to equal that. Yeah, two to the eighth power is 256. Perfect. So those are inverses. All right, how about this? How would we rewrite this log? Four to the half equals two. Four to the half equals two. And next. M to the T equals N. And I have not discussed this. So whenever the base is not labeled next to the log, there's no subtext. This is referencing a natural log, which means the base is 10. So if you ever are, don't see the little number down below, you just see the argument value. That means it is a natural log and that base is known to be 10. They just don't put it in there because that's assumed nothing's there. So how would we rewrite this? What's our base? 10 to the 10 squared equals 100. There you go. Okay, so question 19 asks us to solve for the x value or our variable value. What do we have to do to a log before we can start to solve it? Or before we can solve for the X? Can I solve when it looks, when it's in logarithmic form? We have to rewrite it. We do, and what's that gonna look like rewritten as an exponential function? Three to the zero equals X. You bet. So now we just solve it, we evaluate it. What does three to the zero power mean? One. It means one, yes. Anytime you have the zero power, it means the base divided by itself. So three divided by three is gonna be one. So X is one for your solution. Wonderful. Okay. We have a fraction. What do we do so that we don't have to have a fraction? Turn it into a whole number by making the exponent a negative. Yes. Yes, we can make its reciprocal by popping a negative sign onto its exponent so that now we can have five to the negative x equaling 625. Now what do we need to do?
divide by five? Yeah, we need to create the same bases because once our base values are the same, it means our exponents are gonna equal each other. So if I have a base of five over here, I need a base of five over here. So I'm gonna start dividing out five. Five and 125. Divide five out of 125 and I get 25. Divide five out of 25 and get five and five. So five to the fourth power is what 6 25ths or 625 is worth. So I'm going to clean that up just because I have limited space and rewrite this as five to the fourth. So if my bases are the same, I basically ignore them because they don't hold any influence anymore. But I know my exponents need to equal each other. So if I have a negative x equaling four, is that my solution? Can you just repeat that last thing you said after you got five to the fourth? So now that my bases are the same, they're basically no longer needed. Oh, okay. Just ignore them. I just then focus on the exponents. I need them to equal each other. And in doing so, it lets me solve for my unknown. So I set that up. Negative x equals four. So is this my answer? Does it need to be inverse of, or does it need to be? Yeah. And great terminology. Yes, we need to make the inverse of this. We cannot have the negative on the variable. So to make the inverse, which just means flipping the signs, we wrap everything in parentheses, multiply it by a negative in front. So a negative times a negative is a positive, and a negative times a positive is a negative. So the solution to this exponential function is x equals negative 4. Bravo. All right. How are we going to solve this one? I have seven times five to the T power equaling eight hundred seventy five. How do I find out what T is? Where do I start? So I know when trying to isolate a variable, I work with, I, I basically work the furthest away and then work my way in closer to that variable. So the thing that's furthest away from this variable is the seven. So I need the seven to go away because it's showing seven is being multiplied. How do I make seven disappear? Divide the seven out of both sides. Divide seven off of both sides. And when I do that, we should have 125. So 5t equals 125. Well, we thankfully just had reduced a base, and we knew that 5 to the third power gives us 125. So I'm going to replace the 125 with 5 to the third, because we took 125 and we were able to divide 5 out of it three times. So 5 to the t equals 5 to the third power. What does t equal? Three. Three, you got it. So the solution to our function is T equals three. Okay, last one here. I need to solve this, I need to solve for X. What's my first step gonna be? Rewrite it. Rewrite it. So what is it going to be? What is it going to show when I rewrite it? Two to the negative four equals X. Beautiful. Two to the negative four equals X. So since X is already by itself, it means we just need to evaluate this side. I'm going to clean up some space since we've already taken care of this earlier stuff. Okay. 
So how do we evaluate two to the negative four? Our starting point is getting rid of the negative on the exponent. What do I need to do to make it a positive exponent? Wrap it up and multiply it by negative. That would, that would only work if the negative was on one of these guys. But what does a negative exponent mean? means we flipped this. So to get the negative off of that exponent, we need to flip our number. So instead of having two as a whole number, I have to have one over two, and then I can put the exponent on it. And now that this two is where it's supposed to be, it's place value, the four can be positive. Because when I have a negative on this, and this is a whole number, this means that this whole number is actually worth less than a whole. It's a decimal value, okay? So one half is less than a whole, so that works. But again, we still have to the fourth power, so we need to evaluate this. What does two to the fourth power mean? What does it equal? 16. 16, you bet, because it's 2 times 2, which is 4, times 2, which is 8, times 2, which is 16. So our solution is 1 16th. X equals 1 16th. Okay, so in these two exponential functions, you're going to be asked, what is the gr rate of growth or decay? So, so how much are we growing or decaying by every time it's calculated? Where are we going to look to determine that? The information inside the parentheses. Yes, our B value, because whatever is on the exponent is on is our B value, which is our growth factor. Okay, we want to know though, our growth rate. So how do we find that? Add it to one. We, so this number, this in an exponential function, we have a, b to the x and b is the result of one plus the rate. So this number here had the rate added to one. So to find what the rate is, if I plugged in 1.6 here, how do I get R by itself? I take away one. So when I take away one, I'm left with, sorry, that's a funky one. I'm left with 0.6. So we just subtract one away from whatever our B value is to find our rate of growth or decay. So what is our growth rate as a percent? 60. 60%, you got it. All right, now what is our growth rate or decay for this one? Negative 15. Yes, exactly, because again, still the same idea here, 0.85 equals one plus the rate. When I take away one from each side, I'm left with negative 0.15, okay? And we know it's decay when the B value is less than one. The percentage that it shows is always how much remains. So we figure out, well, how much is missing from 100%? 15 is. So is a negative 15%. You want to make sure you're including that it is a negative because it is a loss. It is a decay. And that negative sign lets us indicate that. Otherwise, we'd be saying it's a 15% growth, but it's not. So and it has to include the percentage, right? So these will have, these are multiple choice questions on the test. Okay. So they already have the format that I want them in. They'll have the percentage sign on them. 
Okay, so you will be asked to find the function of f based on the function of g. So this is called a, these are composite functions where we plug one function into the value of the other. So what am I plugging in where for this? I have notes, but I have no idea what any of it means. Okay. Um, so thing, we focus on the inner value. We focus on G. So in the G function, if I plug in an X, this is my answer. Because I don't actually have a number value, I'm not going to have an G of X equals 5. Because I, didn't, I can't solve. I don't have any value. So this input creates this as an output. So then what we do is this is our answer to the first equation and we plug that in for the value of x in our second equation so we solve for the f function based on the answer of the g function and just plug it in okay because remember inverse functions the input of one the input and output of one function is the reverse in the other so we're just taking this plugging it in here and replacing X with what it says X is going to be worth. Kind of like when we had the substitution method. Okay, and I didn't have anything else, so I, I solved. How do I simplify this? Distribute. We distribute. So four times two X gives us? Eight X. Eight X. And four times a negative one. Negative four. Negative four. So the function f of g is 8x minus four. That's all you can do. That's your answer. And we know that these functions are not inverses of each other because it didn't simplify to x. We know that they were inverses if I plug this into the other one and I have it equaling x so that those x and y's are reversed. But it didn't happen. I had a completely different value, so not inverse functions. So if we are asked to solve this equation or this function, how are we going to solve this function? When I have an exponential function and I'm trying to solve for an unknown, I need to remember that a to the m equals a to the n. And if a and a are the same, it means that m equals n. Okay. Do I currently have an a and an a? Or this a, same number in two spots. Do we start with the prime factorization of 27? Yeah, we okay. Our, okay. our first step is to make the same bases on each side. So 27 can get broken down by three so that we have the same bases. So if, if, when I divide three out, I get nine. When I divide three out, I get three. So 27 becomes three to the third. So if three to the two X equals three to the three, now that my bases are the same, I ignore them and I only need to worry about my exponent values and they are supposed to equal each other, okay? So how do I solve for X? Divide by two. We divide the two off of both sides so that it cancels out on the left. So x equals three halves. 
So how would we start to solve this function? Turn the exponent into a negative. Turn the exponent into a negative so that we can flip our fraction to a whole number. So now I have four to the x power, negative x power equaling 64. Where do I go from here? Divide by negative four. So we're not no. going to divide by negative four, but we are going to divide a four out because we want four as our base. So when I divide four out of 64, I get 16 and divide four out of 16 gives me four. So that means four to the negative X equals four to the third. So what's my next step? Uh, cancel out the fours. Basically cancel out the fours so that I have a negative X equaling three. Am I done? No. We need to turn the, get rid of the negative on the X. And how do I do that? Wrap it up and multiply it by negative. You bet, we have to make the inverses. We do that by wrapping everything up in parentheses, putting a negative in front. So now I can just flip the signs of everything inside. So X equals negative three. So these two logarithms are just gonna be asking you to rewrite them in exponential function form. So what does our first log look like as an exponential function? What's our base? The base is 10. 10. And what is its exponential value? Do we have to rewrite the decimal as a fraction? Nope. OK. So 0. 0.876. Equals 6. There you go. OK, how about this one? Six to the W equals five? Yes. So this time it had the, the variable or the term in front, but we're still, we always have to cross, if, if we do the circle, we have to cross past the equal sign twice. I can't keep it to the right. I can't go to the right here because I would just cross once. I go to the log, I go over to what it's supposed to equal, and then I go back to what was ever on that log. So log six to the W, is five, there you go. So we're gonna be asked to determine if these two functions are inverses of each other. That means when I plug one function in as the variable for the other one, they cancel out. So it doesn't tell us which we have to plug in in which order. So that gives us a little flexibility. All we have to determine in this case, is it true or false? Are these inverses? Yes, true, or are they not? False, okay? So any guess as to how we can determine that? They are. Okay, they are, why do you say so? Because if you, on the second equation, if you divide x plus 6 by 6, you get 6x negative 6, don't you? 6x six, six, negative 6. Uh, Is that inverse? Or, I mean, and then if you have 6x minus 6 and you, because that's multiplication and you divide it, wouldn't you not get the same as, maybe I'm wrong. Okay, I'm not following it. They are inverse functions, but I'm not, I'm gonna show a way to prove it. Oh, well, I don't know how to prove it. <laughs> okay. All right, did that, 
I just made a stink face on the recording version of this. Oops. All right, so to know whether two functions are inverses of each other, I plug one a function in for the x value of the other function and see if it all solves to x. So when I take this, I plug it in, I now have instead of x, I have 6x six minus 6, and then a plus 6 over 6. My negative 6 and positive 6 cancel out, leaving me with 6x over 6. X or 6 divided by 6 turns into 1. 1x one. One just equals x. So I would say true, these are inverse functions. I could have even taken the g function and plugged it in uh, for the x of the f function by going 6 times g's value, which was x plus 6 over 6 minus 6. And when I have a whole number times a fraction, I got to turn that whole number into a fraction. So now I have a numerator and denominator across from each other. They cancel out. That leaves me with x plus 6 over 1, which is just x plus 6. And then I have the negative 6 that I bring in there. These 6s, because they're inverses, cancel out, leaving me with just x. So either way I did it, I still get that x is my solution. And when that's the case, they are inverse equations. So if you were asked to calculate how much money is in your savings account, if you invested $7,000 at 3.2% interest compounding quarterly for eight years, we need to plug this into our formula A equals P times one plus R over N times N to the T where our rate goes here, the number of times calculated in a year goes here, then we multiply the number of times it's calculated in a year by the number of years that pass. So I need to turn 3.2% into its decimal equivalent. Well, that is three as a whole percent value. So it goes in the hundreds place and then the two follows after that. Compounding quarterly means four times in a year and four times in a year times eight years. Okay, so PEMDAS says we divide before we can add inside parentheses. So when I go 0 0.032 divided by four, I get 0 0.008. Well, that's a pretty reasonable number. If this was a giant number, you would make sure you do not re eliminate any of those place values because it can make a difference to the penny on what your output is. So you want to keep it all, okay? So then we take the uh, eight thousandths and we add one to it. Then we go four times eight to get 32. So it's saying in eight years, interest is going to be compounded or calculated 32 times. So we need to raise this amount to that power. So I type in 1.008 x to the y, so I can put in whatever root I want and hit 32, which is going to give me 1.290437655640578. Okay, I'm just going to keep that all on my calculator. Then that principle that I had, I'm now going to put here and multiply it by my interest. Just an FYI, because of that, it's saying I basically had a 29% growth or raise rise in my principal at the end of all of this time. So then I multiply it by 7,000 and I get the amount in my account after eight years is $9,000. $33.06. Make sure you round the penny. I had 0 0.063, which means three is not making that six rise. So I just drop it. And there is my amount. So now we have a decay situation where there are 10,000 microorganisms that are, are, are dying off and they're dying at about 20% uh, a day decay. And we want to figure out, well, how many of these organisms are going to be left, left after 10 days? So we need to convert this to just our regular exponential function. You only use the crazy function uh, formula that we just had when it's compounding interest. Everything else is just a, b to the x. So a, our initial value, our b, which means we're taking one and adding our rate to this. Well, because this is a decay, it's a negative. I need to take 20% off of 
which means I have 80% of those organisms remaining each time every day, every time this is calculated. And it's being calculated over 10 days, so 10 is my exponent. So I'm going to take 0 0.08, 0 0.08, oh, sorry, not 0 0.08, 0 0.8, x to the y, 10, and that's going to leave me with 0 0.10737418824. All right. Again, looking at because this is representing a, a percentage, if it's, I think of it as 10.7. So there's only about 11% of these organisms remaining after this amount of time. So, but you're not being asked to identify that. I just, it's kind of just interesting stuff to be aware of and what this number is indicating. So now we take that big decimal value, we multiply it by 10,000, and it says then after 10 days, um, we are going to have 1,073.74 organisms left, okay? Uh, when giving answers, and there may be a lot of decimal places, generally just, just two decimal places should get you there, okay? So if you include at least up to two decimal places, then that's good. So we're given, at the end of the test, you're going to be given four equations where you need to put them in order from the steepest to shallowest curve. And that curve is determined by the B value. The closer to one that B value is, the shallower the slope. Because if you have, B represents 100%, so one, plus whatever the rate of growth is. So if that number, the B value is really close to one, it means that there was very, very little growth or decay. So there's very little change each time it's calculated. The further away you get, the more dramatic the amount of change is. So the easiest way to determine this is we could look at the numbers, which one's further away from one. I'm saying, um, oh, 0.15, if we think of it as 100, you know, oh, 0.15, that'd be 115. That is 15 spots away. So I'm going to say, 0.15. Then if I look at 0.7, well, that's 30. Actually, I don't even like this example. Okay. What I like to do is look at what was my rate of growth or decay. Because this is over, because this is under one, it means this is loss. How much was taken away from 100% to get to 70%? It was a 30% loss. To go from 100% down to 51, how much was lost? We lost 49%, okay? If I have 1.15, how much was gained? 15%. And uh, 1.37, how much was gained? 37%. So you're looking at the greatest, the smallest percent changes to the greatest. And it, we don't necessarily care if it's positive or negative. We were looking at how far away from 100 are we? So I'm just gonna just even get rid of those. So those aren't a distraction. Our smallest number, and it's going to want you to go from the steepest to the shallowest. So that means I'm going to find the one that had the greatest rate of change, which is the 49%. So this would be what I have as my steepest. Okay, then I look at the next value down from there. 37% is a greater rate of change. So this is my second steepest. Then we're looking at the shallowest. Okay, which one had the least amount of change? Well, this was the least, so it's last. And what is the second shallowest? 30. Okay, so I just kind of am putting it in descending order. And that's how you can determine which one is your steepest slopes.